Hey guys, I am back. We are nearing a hundred thousand subscribers on this YouTube channel, which my mind is still not fully wrapping itself around. Um, I also want to say that once I hit a hundred thousand subscribers, we will be doing a giveaway um, of some of my favorite products. All of it is not endorsed. All of it is non-sponsored that I will be sending you from New York City to wherever you are. So stay tuned. We'll talk more about that once we hit the 100,000 because I never like to give anything away until I actually receive it. So that's just like a life advice. Don't give away your bonus until you actually have it in your bank account. So moving on. Today, we are going to talk about sunscreens. Last week, I did a reaction video. The biggest takeaway from that particular routine was that she forgot the sunscreen. And so I thought to myself, it's a great segue into our next video, which is going to be today, Sunscreen 101. I completely forgot. Hey guys, I am Dr. Shireen Idris. I actually never introduced myself as doctor. I just say I'm Shireen, but I am a cosmetic dermatologist based in New York City and welcome to my YouTube channel where I do this series called Pillow Talk Durham on Instagram, usually from my bed. Here I'm doing it sitting down for you guys. It's a little bit more of a formal setting. One day I'll actually have an office. Um, so I hope you guys join the fun. You like, subscribe and join along because we learn, grow and evolve together every single week. So without further ado, sunscreen 101. Before jumping into what is a sunscreen, I think it's very important to answer why do we need a sunscreen? So the sun mm, offers us many different things. It offers us warmth through infrared light. It offers us sight so we can actually see things through visible light. And it offers us something that we can neither see or feel, which is ultraviolet light. And it's really important to understand the distinction between the three when talking about sunscreens. Scientifically, ultraviolet light has been proven to be a human carcinogen, meaning it contributes to the risk of developing skin cancer. Obviously, the sun offers us many other benefits as well. There is no denying that. So for everybody out there who is all peace, love, you know, I only want sun, I don't want sunscreen. Yeah, you're right, the sun does offer benefits. However, it also comes with a severe risk. And everything in life is a nuance. It's not black, it's not white, it's shades of gray. And knowing how to protect your skin within those shades of gray, while also allowing your skin to reap the benefits of the sun is the most important thing. So when we're talking about ultraviolet light, it is anything really below the 400 nanometer spectrum. 100 to 280 is UVC, which we're just not gonna talk about because usually that does not cross the ozone layer and the atmosphere to reach the earth unless you live in certain areas, but we're just, it's beyond the scope of this video. Then you have UVB, which ranges from 280 to 320 nanometers. Now UVB makes up about 5% of the ultraviolet light spectrum. And then we have UVA, which I am going to lump them, range from 320 to approximately 400 nanometers. I lump them because there's actually technically a UVA2 and a UVA1, but just for the matters of simplicity, let's just lump them together. So we have UVC, forget about them, UVB, and UVA. UVB hits your skin most superficially and contributes to burning. Think of B as in burn. And with UVB, given that you can get burning, it can cause a lot of issues such as skin cancer or precancers. Um, now, it also contributes to the vitamin D synthesis that our body actually makes. And that's where those people, those people who claim that they need to be living out in the sun in order to get vitamin D at all times, use this particular argument. We will address that later on in this video. UVA penetrates deeper within the skin, contributing to aging the breakdown of collagen, the breakdown of tissues, the formations of fine lines and wrinkles, as well as certain types of skin cancers. So both of them contribute to cancer, UVB more so than UVA, UVA more so for aging, UVB more so for burning, and yeah. UVA does also penetrate through windows. So I'm sitting in front of a window right now um, and I actually wear sunscreen whenever I sit here. Every time I sit here doing a video for you guys, I do my makeup, I do my thing, and then I top it off with sunscreen. Also, interestingly, both UVA and UVB diminish your skin's immune response. 
And that's interesting because there are certain diseases, autoimmune diseases like psoriasis, where your skin is so revved up that having that diminished response calms it down and makes it appear better. Interesting to note because oftentimes people with psoriasis, for example, think, let me just go sit out in the sun all day, every day, and they actually then put themselves at risk of developing skin cancers. And so you, again, it's a very fine balance, okay? Understanding how much your skin actually needs, whereas you actually wanna protect it most of the time. So what is an SPF? SPF stands for Sun Protection Factor. It really was created in determining the amount of UVB protection offered by a sunscreen. What it actually means is the amount of time your skin will need to burn when using that sunscreen. So for example, if it takes me, let's say, 10 minutes to burn in the sun without any sunscreen, if I use an SPF 15, it's going to take me 15 times 10, 150 minutes to actually reach that same level and burn. So you might think, great, SPF 15 is perfect, it's all I need. False, because SPF 15 only hits about 94% of UVB rays, whereas SPF 30 goes up to 97% and SPF 50 goes up to 98% protection. So even though it might seem like a small jump, it's actually protecting you a whole lot more. And so as a rule of thumb, anywhere between 30 to 50 is your safest bet. More than 50 becomes a little bit dangerous again, only because why does he always walk in in the most awkward moments when I go into the danger zone of this conversation? So I'm going to ignore him. He's just standing there awkwardly. More than SPF 50, once you reach around SPF 100, all right, it's a false sense of security. Honestly, I could not time this better. Like when I married this man, he gave me a false sense of security that life would be fine. All that right. was, he sold me a lie. He sold me a lie. So anyway, SPF 50, 30 to 50 is the range you sort of want to be in. So that being said, when doing testing, they applied a shit ton of sunscreen on these people while testing them. We're talking about approximately six teaspoons of lotions or cream all over their body throughout the testing period. And there was a reapplication phase. Most people in real life are using like, and I'll give you an example. They'll take the sunscreen and go, bloop, beep, 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 I got my sunscreen on. It doesn't work that way. They're applying it incorrectly and they're not reapplying it, which contributes to actually less protection than what they think they're getting. So false sense of security, my husband, false sense of security, higher SPFs, false sense of security, utilizing it once and not utilizing it correctly, all contribute to the misuse of sunscreens. All right, have we made ourselves that cannot be made on sunscreen. Waterproof, it's misleading, nothing is waterproof. You might swim, dry yourself and rub off your all of your sunscreen. Sunblock, Sunscreens are not complete blockers of the sun, so no amount of sun protection is going to offer you 100% of a block. So again, it's misleading. Um, sweat proof, yeah, no. If you're sweating, you're more likely dripping through it, and it's not going to offer 100% protection. Sweat resistant is something of a bit of a nuance um, because it might kind of fight through that sweat, but sweat proof is a no-no. And then reef friendly doesn't mean anything either in the sense that it is not a regulated term by the FDA. Things you can do for yourselves as a very basic steps is avoid anything with oxybenzone and octinoxate, the two ingredients banned by Hawaii as of 2021. Also veer away from nanoparticle sized zinc or titanium because although zinc or titanium is usually safer, when it becomes that small in size, it can have residual effects on the coral reef. So look for instead micro-sized, okay? Not, or non-nano sized. And then finally, use lotions instead of sprays or mists, because like I said, the sprays or mists can kind of leave a residue behind on the sand. Let's talk about UVA. UVA is actually the more interesting UV of the bunch, and only recently has it been incorporated into sunscreens offering protection against it. And those are sunscreens where you see broad spectrum, for example, like this one by l d broad spectrum UV coverage. So whenever you see broad spectrum, at least in the US, you know it's covering for both UVA and UVB. What's interesting is that there is no international grading system that has been approved across the board for UV protection, all right? In the past, it used to be PPD, the Persistent 
pigment darkening of the person was how they measured the UVA damage. That is not done anymore. It is outdated because now they do it more in vitro in order to measure it correctly and more scientifically and more specifically. It used to be done in vivo, so on actual human pe people. PA is also one of the measurements that you'll notice on some of your bottles. For example, this one by Color Science has a PA++. Can you guys see it? I can never do this correctly. Boom, I think you see it there. Um, this was used and is used in the Far East. Again, it is not an internationally agreed level of um, UVA protection, but it is there to kind of give you an idea of how much UVA protection a particular sunscreen is offering. So it's just as an, it's a nice guide. Certain ingredients cover for both UVA and UVB, and when you see broad spectrum, you know that that is what that sunscreen is offering. You actually know that a third of the protection offered by that sunscreen is dedicated to UVA coverage. So that's something that should be reassuring to you, that should you know you're doing for yourself when it comes to the aging process as well as the protective process of protecting our skin against skin cancer. There are two main types of ingredients when it comes to sunscreens. There are chemical slash organic ingredients, okay? And then you have physical slash mineral slash inorganic ingredients. And these nomenclatures are used sort of all over the place uh, interchangeably, leading to more confusion and mass hysteria. Is it organic? Is it inorganic? If it's inorganic, is it bad? Am I going to faint? Am I going to die? Am I going to melt? Am I going to this? So basically, just so you know, they're used interchangeably. It used to be believed that the chemical sunscreens absorb the heat, ultraviolet light, convert it into heat, and then dissipate it, okay? And that physical sunscreens reflect the ultraviolet light. It has come to our attention in recent years through recent studies that physical sunscreens actually do a little bit of both. They scatter visible light and they absorb ultraviolet light. So they actually work in the same way that chemical sunscreens do, but they also offer the added benefit of reflecting visible light, okay? The biggest downside to them is that they leave a white cast. So they are near ideal when it comes to protective, protecting you, but cosmetically, they are not as ideal. And that is why we have gone down this rabbit hole of creating chemical sunscreens and chemical filters to help protect our skin. And this is why one is not always better than the other. I also touched base on the fact that physical blockers are less than ideal cosmetically. Most recently, brands have come up with ways to break down those physical sunscreens, whether it's zinc or titanium, into tiny little particles called nanoparticles. This has also been a source of debate because there have been people who are worried about the absorption rate of nanoparticles in your system. Nothing has been proven systemically with these nanoparticles. As of yet, further studies are still needed. However, my concern with the nanoparticles has more to do with the coral reef as even nanoparticle-sized zinc has been shown to be detrimental to the coral reef. And so when looking for sunscreens that are physical sunscreens, I usually ask people or patients to look for na non-nanoparticle-sized or micro-sized zinc. So how do I know which type of sunscreen to use? Base it on your skin type. If you are somebody who is sensitive, you know, look for hypoallergenic sunscreens. Those are your best bet. If you are somebody who is dry, look for sunscreens in a moisturizer form. And then what about if you are oily or acne prone, then you want to look for sunscreens that are non-comedogenic. And there are some, although rare, sunscreens that are in gel-based forms. And those ones are usually also better for people who tend to be on the hairier end of the spectrum. Um, and lastly, if you have a very active lifestyle, you want to look for sunscreens that are water resistant. Water resistant sunscreens gives you the amount of time that the sunscreen actually protects you while you are swimming or working out or sweating. Usually it's around a 40 minute or an 80 minute time that it actually labels on the sunscreen itself. So certain things just for you guys to keep in mind. Let's quickly jump into different types of sunscreens that I have here. Let us start with physical sunscreens, my favorites. The one I use, for example, on my kids is this one by Think Baby. 
on the back it actually writes zinc oxide non nano particle so a lot of these brands i don't even know if i'm doing this correctly are now pointing out that their zinc is non nano particle if you are worried about the coral reef and your environment these ones are the ones that you want to look for. It leaves a crazy white cast. I actually used this particular one in my sunscreen video when I was showing you guys the importance of double cleansing when you're using thicker sunscreens, especially the ones with zinc that tend to stick on. So this is one that I like for kids a lot. Now, the question about should I use sunscreen in infants? So the guidelines are if you're less than six months old, you do not need to use sunscreen on your child. Make sure you're covering them with protective clothing, that they are staying in the shade, that they're really standing out of the sun. The reason that is because infants have thinner skin and are more likely to develop irritations on their skin. And so you want to minimize that risk of developing an irritation or even an absorption because their skin is not yet fully developed. And so six months is the sort of rule as to when you can start applying sunscreens. After six months, go buck wild. I mean, I cover my kids every single day in zinc or titanium. Um, zinc has a little bit better coverage than titanium, so I tend to pick zinc. Um, they look like ghosts and they are going to hate me later in life, but they will thank me when they actually start to care about how they look. So zinc for the win. So this is one of them. Another one that I've recently been introduced to that I actually really like is this one by First Aid Beauty. It is the Weightless Liquid Mineral Sunscreen with Zinc Oxide, SPF 30. It is oil-free. It is non-comedogenic. So if you are somebody who is oily or acne-prone, it is a nice one. Um, I also like it because they utilize non-nanoparticle zinc. Um, and it is extremely elegant. And I will show you guys um, because it feels a little grainy when you first apply it. But then it just melts in. And you know what? I'm extremely, extremely, extremely pale. So it just gives me a little bit of a tint. If you are somebody with darker skin tone, it'd be nearly invisible on you. So this is one that I really, truly appreciate. Um, and it is purely zinc oxide. Then we have this one by Supergoop, which is another one, a zinc screen. This is not as dark as the one by um, First Aid Beauty, but it is also utilizing non-nanoparticle zinc which i think is important especially if you are going to be out and about and by the ocean etc it's a little bit more pink it's not as grainy but it also has a very nice lightweight sheer finish to it so these ones are um, probably some of my favorite zinc sunscreens so mixing now between zinc and titanium some of the brands choose to mix them this one is by sun bum it is a mixture of zinc oxide and titanium dioxide. Um, why do they choose to do this? It depends on formulation. It depends on, you know, cosmetic delivery. This one is also, I believe, non-nanoparticle. I'm not 100% sure because on their website, only the spray um, was self-described as non-nanoparticle. This one was not. So I honestly don't know if it is 100%, but it is a mineral sunscreen that you can get at your local drugstore, which isn't bad. The reason I do not love sprays is because you do not measure how evenly you're applying the sunscreen, number one. Number two, they are actually not reef safe because once you're spraying it on yourself, you're usually at the beach spraying it on yourself, it could stick to the sand and with the waves, a lot more sunscreen is actually gonna enter into the ocean. So just something for you guys to think about if you are trying to be eco-conscious. Um, and if you're trying to just be, you know, skin conscious, it doesn't really protect as evenly or as well. And it gives you another false sense of security. Why I don't love the sprays. Moving on to other brands that I am questionable about their nanoparticle size. I don't love this one by CeraVe. Uh, it publicizes itself as being rich in ceramides, niacinamide, and hyaluronic acid. So you would think it's going to offer you those benefits. But again, a sunscreen really overlaps and overpowers any other active ingredients. So you're not going to get 100% of those benefits. Note to the wise, whenever buying a sunscreen, just flip it to the back. In the US, you're going to have a drug facts label and you will see the active forms of sunscreen in that sunscreen itself. The FDA does not require brands to differentiate between nanoparticle sized zinc or titanium versus non nanoparticle size or micro sized and so it's you as a consumer to do your homework one sunscreen that i find particularly interesting is this one by isden and this one is pure zinc 
I don't know if it's nano or not, but I like it because this one protects your skin from the damage that has been created. So it helps to reverse that damage through their own technology. Um, it's a beautiful sunscreen as well. And then finally, Color Science has a broad range of mineral sunscreens. Again, I do believe that these are not non-nano. I think they're nano, but they come in various different colors. And I think for a physical blocker, they offer a nice different range of shades. So that's that. Um, Elta is one that my patients love. I do not like them personally. Um, I, I don't know. <laughs> Nothing against Elta MD. Patients love them. Personally, my skin did not gel with it. And it's just a personal matter. Some people like potatoes. Some people like tomatoes. You know, I don't know. Um, Elta MD UV Clear. Again, the reason I think I'm annoyed by this is because it publicizes itself as transparent zinc oxide as it is written on the front. Can you guys see that? Transparent zinc oxide there. Oh. But if you read the back, it's actually mixed with octinoxate, which is on the no-no list for coral reefs. And then the UV physical fusion, UV physical broad spectrum defense, this is just zinc and titanium, and it is also publicized as a transparent zinc oxide. Note to the wise, when you see transparent, sheer invisible zinc it's usually nanoparticle okay that's just for you guys to kind of know the difference what those wordings actually mean when it comes to chemical sunscreens i love this particular one by supergoop the glow screen this has avobenzone octisylate and octocrylene which basically offers you a broad range of both uva and uvb um i will tell you guys though that my eyes do get irritated if i touch my eyes after applying this i need to wash my hands um it is no joke i've had to stop and pull over while driving um because i do have very sensitive eyes but it gives you a beautiful sheen at the end i actually have it on today um and i think that it kind of replaces the makeup for me. Um, so that's that one. Um, this is one by Sun Bum that, you know, I also appreciate. The ingredients in this one, which is the SPF 50 uh, broad spectrum, SPF 50, has none of the dangerous ingredients for coral reef. The biggest ones being oxybenzone and octinoxate, um, which can cause coral reef bleaching. Hawaii has actually banned those two ingredients. So just so that you guys know. This is one. I don't care for the spray. Like I mentioned, it kind of leaves a residue all over the sand and then therefore more sunscreen gets into the ocean, which is unnecessary. Um, Rihanna has one by Fenty Skin, which came out earlier last year. This is a mix of various um, chemical sunscreens. There is nothing physical about this one and it is reef safe as she like as she wrote on her box. Made with care for coral reefs. Does not contain oxybenzone or octinoxate, which were the two ingredients that was banned by Hawaii. It also has refillable packages. I have a little bit of a weird relationship with refillable packages because I actually think they deliver more waste over time. Discussion for another day, depending on how it's done. You know, it has to be done really well with very minimal packaging and secondary packaging in order for it to actually be worthwhile, you know? But again, discussion for another day. And finally, we have these fun zinc sticks, which are totally a revival of the 80s. This is a um, Australian brand. I love the concept. The execution of this particular brand is a little bit iffy because I don't know why they decided to incorporate it with ethyl methoxycinamate, which is octinoxate. Basically, when it is a full-on zinc stick. If you're going to be loud and proud about wearing zinc, don't mix it with another active that has questionable properties to the environment or to your skin. So I would redo this product without anything else and be loud and proud and be completely visible, you know? Um, and hopefully that trend picks up again because it was a fun trend from the 80s that died, you know, very, very fast. So that is the zinc stick. So listen, this was sort of a sunscreen 101 in a nutshell. I, it is not as clear cut as one would think. 
when in doubt just go for a physical zinc or titanium if you want to do more reading obviously i always encourage you to learn more um, and educate yourselves on the matter because physicals are not your end all be all solution either and some people just they don't vibe with them that well so i would tell you and really encourage you to do your reading understand the differences understand the nuances of what you're using and how it not only benefits you but also helps protect the environment i am dr shereen idris i hope you guys found this video helpful please make sure to give it a thumbs up like it and subscribe below um, and if you have any sunscreen questions let me know oh we forgot about vitamin d you'll still get vitamin d we might do this video for another topic this topic for another video some other day but do not be afraid of sunscreen blocking your vitamin d production it is a myth on that note namaste i wish you all a great saturday